Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. And welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. I am Anushka Saxena, a research analyst with the Indo-Pacific Studies program here at the Takshashila Institution. And I am joined by Amit Kumar, my colleague who is also a research analyst with the program. Today, we'll attempt to navigate trends and developments in the Chinese economy to look out for in 2023. Welcome to the episode, Amit. Hello, Anushka. Glad to be here. So the week-long spring festival celebrations just gave over in China and Chinese media sources are telling us that there is a positive growth in consumption due to the festivities. I believe they've reported a 12% growth in uh, overall consumption as compared to the pre-COVID levels in 2019. They've also reported a 130% hike in the sales revenue of the tourism sector. How do you interpret these signals? Also, uh, GDP growth projections by firms like Morgan Stanley and the IMF are looking up, something to the tune of 5.2% for China. So what do you make of these uh, recent data and projections? And do you think an economic rebound is underway in the country? If we look at China's data on GDP growth since 2013, we observe that the Chinese economy had been slowing down even before the pandemic. From 7.8% in 2013, the figure has seen a consistent decline to 6% in 2019 and 2.2% in 2020. The lowest That was the lowest during uh, Xi Jinping's reign. But that was on account of pandemic and consistent with the global trends. The figure for 2021 was around 8%, but only due to the pace effect. The latest data for 2022 puts the growth rate at 3%, well below the projection of 5% by the Chinese government. Then there have been both internal and external pressures on Chinese economy beginning in 2017. For instance, domestically, if you see Xi Jinping has tightened regulations on private enterprises and big tech, including the platform economy and tech sectors. In 2020, we also saw the Evergrande crisis and the bursting of the property market bubble. This was a huge setback as real estate accounts for around a quarter of the Chinese GDP. Banks too have been facing intense uh, profitability crisis as they are being motivated to lend more at lower interest rates. But uh, amidst uh, slowing domestic demand and a weak uh, home buying sentiment, their stability is threatened. If you look at uh, the external environment, the sentiment against China has sharpened, especially within the US. We saw the unraveling of the US-China trade war in 2016. China's aggressive foreign policy and willingness to use economic coercion have fueled talks regarding decoupling and reducing dependencies and uh, searching for alternative supply chains and then came the pandemic and Xi Jinping's flagship dynamic zero COVID policy. These factors surely exacerbated the effects of an already slowing down of uh, Chinese economy. But since the announcement of the 20 guidelines for easing of uh, zero COVID restrictions in November 2022 and the subsequent scrapping away of the policy itself in early January of 2023, projections put into the growth of the Chinese economy have gone up. Global agencies like IMF, Morgan Stanley and other pegged the Chinese growth for 2023 between 4 to 5 percent. Given China had long been the engine of global economy, it will certainly impact global recovery and major economies around the world. I believe the property sector predicament isn't really over yet too. Uh, despite positive signs in retail sales during the lunar year holidays, as per data reported by the China Real Estate Information Corporation, housing sales overall have only gone down. And this has now become part of the larger global trend where there is a slump in the overall global housing demand, especially in the US, the UK, Australia and New Zealand. The Chinese property market shakeup has clearly had contributing ripple effects in this. In any case, uh, we know that Xi Jinping proposed a new principal contradiction for the Communist Party to resolve back in uh, 2017 between the people's ever-growing needs for a better life and inadequate and unbalanced development. And since then, the primary goal of uh, his flagship Common Prosperity campaign is to eventually lead the making of an olive-shaped society by 2050, one that is uh, narrower at uh, the two ends, which are the higher income and the lower income levels, and biggest in the center, which is the middle income level. However, with the economy slowing down in addition to the declining population and the increasing age dependency ratio, which under Xi Jinping has risen from 38 to about 44%, can lead the country to fall into a middle income trap. And this is added on to by the fact that the Chinese workforce itself is shrinking from its peak of 996 
seven million people in 2014 to about 875 million people in 2022. Moreover, uh, high net worth individuals from China are facing a risk of being forced to leave the country due to restrictions on "quote unquote" the disorderly expansion of capital, and this can lead to a future stagnation of income levels. So, hence another perhaps irreversible economic trend underway under Xi is that the country is likely to grow old before it will grow rich, and this is a dilemma the Chinese economy has been grappling with for a while now. And even as the focus has shifted towards high quality economic growth, it will be necessary for China to first develop a highly advanced industrial society to make that happen. Demographic constraints coupled with the pressure on the Chinese economy caused by export reduction, supply chain disruption, and of course a crisis in the property sector, this will be hindered. So we can at least acknowledge that economic recovery is going to be a priority for China in 2023. And the recent shift in the tone of economic policy is indicative of that too. For example, key takeaways from uh, China's Central Economic Work Conference, which was held uh, in December 2022, I think, revealed that the government is going to maintain "quote unquote" the necessary intensity of fiscal spending and a reasonable abundance of liquidity. So that's on the fiscal and monetary policy front. We also see a great emphasis on boosting domestic demand because data is clearly indicating a downfall in domestic consumption and retail sales. So the spring festival boost is a good sign, but to further drive domestic consumption, what do you think is necessary next? Yeah, it is understandable that uh, there's an emphasis on this front. If we look at exports as a percentage of GDP since she came to power in 2013 to 2021, there has been a decline of about four percent. And for an economy of China's size, that four percent is quite significant. Export has been uh, the most important driver of China's economic growth in the past few decades, which in turn has been also the primary source of legitimacy for the party to claim. Moreover, during the pandemic, China experienced an export uh, export boom, where its uh, export as a percentage of GDP remained stable at around 18% between 2019 and 2020 and shot up to 20% in 2021 but the weakening of global economy and that of the demand uh, both inside and outside china has led to a relative plunge in exports of course there is an intense debate going on regarding decoupling and diversification of supply chains both inside and outside china so in line with these priorities China will likely expand funding and support for businesses, increase government incentives for investments across all sectors, work towards raising overall income of urban uh, rural residents and even address housing needs. Household consumption and savings if you look at the data as percentage of GDP have actually remained quite solid and stable at around uh, 38% and 44% respectively in the past 3 years. And we should look out for an increase in these numbers in 2023, given the policy is geared in exactly this direction. Um, looks like uh, prospects for dual circulation are still dwindling uh, because uh, is the stability in savings that you mentioned a consequence of rising incomes, or is the pandemic the primary reason for an increase in savings while the incomes remain stagnant or even reduced? Even the fact that household deposits hit a record high of 10.33 trillion yuan in 2022 from about. 7.4 trillion yuan in 2021 is driven by covid induced financial uncertainties and even as a trend since she is ascendant to power tax revenue has steadily declined from 9.9% of gdp in 2013 to about 8% in 2020 which has translated into stagnation in government spending between uh, these years 2013 to 21 somewhere to the tune of 15.8% of gdp and this creates a mutually detrimental cycle where the lesser the government can invest in expanding incomes the lesser the savings and household consumption are likely to grow and some of the most ambitious tax reforms have been proposed under she especially as part of his common prosperity campaign so if we look at the jhejiang implementation plan and the 2021 work report which was delivered by the jhejiang government in january 2022 uh there is testimony to the varied degrees of tax compensation that rural residents and lower income social groups have been provided with ranging from favorable tax policies for enterprises to tax rebates and credit provision on exports there is also an urgency to quote unquote strive for the full implementation of tax and fee reduction levy consumption based taxes and expand the number of industry sources to be able to earn greater tax revenue and this suggests an upward trend in the number of tax reforms issued under xi jinping uh, with the ultimate goal of creating his flagship shared future for mankind it is still however ironic that even as the common prosperity campaign aims to restructure the tax system to carry out income redistribution xi's tenure has seen some of the 
largest corporate income tax cuts since 1994, which have largely benefited the urban affluent. Quite right, which is uh, why the government is now also looking to uh, share the burden by calling for more foreign direct investments. In his speech at Davos Forum last month, Vice Premier Li Hui uh, stated that uh, domestic circulation cannot function well uh, without "quote unquote" international division of labor, and this is in line with uh, the reality depicted by the numbers. Under Xi, FDI flows inflows uh, as a percentage of GDP have reduced drastically from three percent in 2013 to just about one eight one point eight percent in 2021. Moreover, the real numbers uh, of FDI inflows in China often have the tendency to be distorted. Financial uh, Arbitrage and uh, capital control circumvention, uh, whereas Chinese firms raise offshore uh, funds in Hong Kong and other jurisdiction, or variable interest entities function through uh, Chinese subsidiaries. Many times, uh, such activities uh, that should be classified as uh, portfolio investments get classified as uh, FDI instead. So the flat numbers uh, differ. Anyway, uh, it is clear that uh, in 2023, uh, China will have to expand on FDI inflows even to be able to uh, attain self-reliance. Interesting trends also emerge if one observes uh, Chinese government uh, funding for sectors like education and defense. Even as uh, the CPC has continued to crack down on edtech, leading to billions in losses for private education institutions and uh, for-profit tutoring outfits, uh, there has been a steady decline in the government's funding of education institutions under Xi. As a percentage of total public expenditure, uh, government spending on education reduced from around 13.5 percent in 2013 to around 10.5 percent in 2020. At the same time, the government's uh, military expenditure as a percentage of GDP has remained steady at around uh, 1.7 to 1.8 percent. What this is indicative of uh, for 2023 is that concerted efforts. Uh, Will continue to move uh, towards managing military operations in contested zones around mainland China, with an aim of uh, developing a world-class military by 2035. That's the timeline that the CCP has set for itself. Of course, uh, the agenda of the PLA's modernization will continue to remain an economic priority. Uh, anyway, I want to uh, come back to the point you made about decoupling. Uh, is broad-based decoupling really happening? I think that's uh, the question of the hour. To me, it seems as if the disruptions induced by the pandemic and the emphasis on diversification have led to a short-term focus on finding alternative production centers and markets. But as per the trends recorded in, say, the 2022 China Business Report by the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, only 17% of the companies they surveyed are actually looking to move out of China in the next one to three years, and that too in large part because of zero COVID restrictions. And 30% of their respondents are even planning to expand investments in China because of the growth potential of the vast national market. What do you think about that? Decoupling is uh, easier said than done. Uh, it's really difficult to achieve given the integrated nature of supply chains. Even though there has been pressure from governments, uh, for example, the US to incentivize the companies to move out operations from China, which uh, was again aided by China's own uh, dynamic zero COVID policy. Decoupling is yet to be seen in substantial terms. Take the example of Apple, for instance, because they faced a delay in shipments uh, due to zero COVID protests at the end of the last year. They wanted to diversify their uh, supply chains, and they are looking at uh, India and Vietnam as options. They have already begun assembling uh, iPhone 14s. In India, and uh, have been assembling older models in the country for a while now. Of course, uh, even uh, on this front, challenges persist because uh, you see, assembly is integrated uh, with other supply chains, component and uh, transport. The vendors supplying these components that go into the assembling of the iPhone cannot entirely move out of China for they cater to uh, other customers in China as well. So, and in, uh, if you look at India, the domestic capacity to supply those components is limited. Uh, so, companies moving out. Uh, Uh, like apple uh, would have to also deal with uh, these uh, these sorts of challenges even as per the report uh, issued by uh, japan external trade organization in the next 1 to 2 years 93.7% out of the 697 firms based in china are either looking to expand operations or continue them at the status quo even if it is at increased costs the european chamber's business confidence uh, survey also says that 46% of such firms think it is too early to even consider downsizing china operation that said it is true that uh, there has been an obvious loss in uh, business and investor confidence and that needs to be boosted if china has to retain these foreign companies and investments that same report uh, also says that only 17% of the respondent companies uh, feel that the government policies and regulations uh, 
towards foreign companies had improved in the past year. So China really needs to work on boosting uh, foreign investor confidence to be able to retain uh, these companies in the long term. Right. And uh, there is also the issue of tech regulation and crackdown, which goes counter to the narrative of innovation-based growth that the CPC is driving. There is an emphasis on core technology, self-reliance, and sure, it spreads across the world. And the need for government control over industrial policy specific to China supersedes its consideration towards a market-oriented economy. This is all added on to by the geopolitical competition on critical tech. Anyway, provincial GDPs also show some interesting trends. I think as of 2021, the Tibet Autonomous Region of China has the lowest gross regional product of approximately uh, 208 billion yuan, while that of Guangdong is 12.4 trillion yuan. And there is an interesting income disparity between China's east and western provinces. While most of the provinces in the West and the center West, such as Xinjiang, Tibet, Qinghai, Ningxia, and Gansu, consistently remain low on the gross regional product spectrum, eastern and southeastern provinces, such as Guangdong, Fujian, Zhejiang, Shandong, and Jiangsu, remain quite high. And since the dawn of the pandemic, various central government issued uh, restrictions have been putting greater pressure on local governments to expand income and expenditure. And this will need a higher rate of bond issuance along with a higher deficit rate. The central government has also urged local governments to cut down mortgage rates to push the home buying sentiment. But so far, it has had no avail. Therefore, an analysis of provincial development trends for 2023 is crucial to assess a couple things. The first is to find out where the government's highest tax revenue sources lie. The second is to understand whether the Common Prosperity Campaign is of any success in bridging provincial income disparities for equitable growth. And third is to enable housing recovery to avert another real estate collapse. Yes, and I think uh, the one sector that we haven't yet mentioned but is likely to see continued focus and investment is green innovation. China has observed an energy crunch trend in the past two to three years, and this has increased its reliance on coal. This is amidst uh, China's ambitious green compliance and low carbon targets. This policy sentiment has been reiterated just recently by the Minister of Industry and Information Technology, Zhuang Long, who stressed that the focus will be on tilting uh, uh, more sources for manufacturing enterprises to help them attain uh, high-end and uh, smart and green development. Green technology and climate change cooperation also offers China the opportunity to collaborate with external stakeholders and boost its uh, image on global stage. And so overall, I would say uh, that in tandem with what we have discussed, there is a need to genuinely work towards expanding domestic consumption while enabling household and property sector reform to make the rental space more accessible. Despite uh, positive projections per capita consumption, again, uh, according to the data, has gone down by 0.2% in 2022, and that must be addressed. Investor confidence has to be boosted, and local market protectionism will not help. So the government uh, indeed has to draw a balance between the growth of local businesses and foreign companies. There will also be a need for government to invest regularly in research and innovation, given that the geopolitical competition in the tech sector is likely to intensify as we go forward. In the past decade, there has been uh, only a marginal increase of about uh, 0.4% in R&D spending, which is quite meager and not a good sign, uh, especially considering that if China has to indeed navigate the tech competition credibly, uh, it has to not only spend on R&D, but also put it to practical use. Uh, right. Uh, moreover, I am also bound to believe that the relative easing of monetary and fiscal policy in favor of the private sector is not a strategic or a long term shift, but a temporary fix to stimulate economic growth. The ultimate aim still remains to extend party control in business and finance. Uh, you mentioned uh, Liu He's speech at the Davos Forum and last month he also said at that same forum that the government will do a blood transfusion and blood formation in the real estate sector, by which he meant increasing liquidity and relaxing restrictions on the property market. But we have to watch out for whether this tactical adjustment leads to long-term market-oriented growth or not. That said, thank you Amit for joining me and thank you to our listeners for tuning into another episode of All Things Policy. Thank you, Nishra. It was a pleasure. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, 
If you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in.